We bring you a Democracy Now! special on the growing domestic surveillance state and the Department of Homeland Security's efforts to spy on dissident journalists and activists. In a national broadcast exclusive, we're joined by National Security Agency whistleblower William Binney. He was a key source for James Banford's recent exposure in, in a Wired magazine about the NSA, how the NSA is quietly building the largest spy center in the country, in Bluffdale, Utah. The Utah Spy Center will contain uh, nearly bottomless databases to store all forms of communication collected by the agency, including private emails, cell phone calls, and Google searches and other personal data. Benny served in the NSA for over 30 years, including a time as director of the NSA's World Geopolitical and Military Analysis Reporting Group. Since retiring from the NSA in 2001, he has warned that the agency's data mining program has become so vast that it could, quote, create an Orwellian state. Today marks the first time Benny has spoken on national television about surveillance by the National Security Agency. We're also joined by two individuals who've been frequent targets of government surveillance, Laura Poitras, the Academy Award-nominated filmmaker, and Jacob Applebaum, a computer security researcher who has volunteered with WikiLeaks. Poitras is the director of the documentary films My Country, My Country and The Oath. Both Poitras and Applebaum have been repeatedly detained and interrogated by federal agents when entering the United States. Their laptops, cameras and cell phones have been seized, and presumably their data has been copied. The Justice Department has also targeted Applebaum's online communications. In November, a federal judge ordered Twitter to hand over information about his account. In October, The Wall Street Journal revealed the Justice Department had obtained a secret court order to force Google and the Internet provider Sonic.net to turn over information about Applebaum's email accounts. William Benny, Laura Poitras and Jacob Applebaum will be speaking tonight at the Whitney Museum here in New York for a teach-in on surveillance. The three of them join us here in our studio, together in a broadcast for the first time. We're going to begin with William Benny. You worked for the National Security Agency for more than three decades. Um, Almost four. Almost four decades. Yep. You, for a time, directed the NSA's World Geopolitical and Military Analysis Reporting Group. Tell us what you did, and then why you left, and what happened to you afterwards. Uh, well, I was, I was the technical director of that group uh, that basically looked at the world, so we looked at all the technical problems of uh, uh, in, in the world and see how we could solve uh, collection analysis and reporting on uh, military and geopolitical issues uh, all around the world, every country in the world. So, so it was a rather large uh, technical problem to tackle, but uh, it—and uh, one of the largest uh, problems we thought we had was looking at the World Wide Web and all the uh, ballooning and mushrooming communications in the, in the, in the world. Uh, and, and our ability to deal with that was uh, diminishing over time, so I kind of referred to it as our, our inability to keep up with the rate of change. Uh, so we were falling behind uh, the, the rate of change. So, so uh, we, uh, I had a very small group of people in a lab, and we decided to attack that problem. Um, and uh, we did it by, uh, by looking at how we could graph the, uh, the network of communications and all the communications in the world, and then, and then focus in on that graph and use the graph to, to limit what we wanted to attack. And we basically succeeded at that, but in the process, of course, we scooped up Americans from different places, so we had to protect their identities uh, according to our our laws and uh, privacy rights of u s citizens so under use at eighteen we uh, we built in protections to uh, anonymize their identities so you couldn 't really tell who you were looking at uh, and that 's because the the NSA could do surveillance uh, uh, from abroad, but not of U.S. citizens. Well, and, and you see, the World Wide Web routes things all over, so you never really know where U.S. citizens' communications are going to be routed. So you, you, if you, if you were collecting somewhere else in on another continent, you could still get U.S. citizens. That's that's see, that was a universal problem. So, um, so we devised how to do that and protect U.S. citizens. So, and this is all before 9/11. Um, and we uh, we uh, uh, we devised how to do that and made that effective and operating. So we were actually prepared to deploy uh, about eight months before 9/11 and uh, actually have a system that would run and manage the uh, what I call 20 terabytes a minute of uh, activity. So, uh, uh, but after 9/11, uh, 
all the wraps came off for NSA, and they decided to, uh, between the White House and NSA and CIA, they decided to uh, to eliminate the protection of U.S. citizens and, and collect on uh, domestically. So they started collecting uh, from a commercial, uh, the one commercial uh, uh, company that I know of that participated, uh, provided uh, over 300, well, probably on the average about 320 million records of communication of a U.S. citizen to a U.S. citizen inside this country. What company? AT&T. It was long-distance communications. So they were providing billing data. At that point, I knew I could not stay because of a direct violation of the constitutional rights of everybody in the country. Plus, it violated the Pen Register Law and Stored Communications Act, the Electronic Privacy Act, the Intelligence Acts of 1947 and 1978. I mean, it was just a whole series of Plus all the all the laws covering um, federal communications governing telecoms. I mean, all those laws are being violated, including the Constitution, and that was a decision made that wasn't going to be reversed. So I could not stay there. I had to leave. I, I wanted to get back to for a moment when you say that you were developing a way to cope with the fact that the agency was falling behind just because the sheer volume of the material mm. that they were sweeping up was so great that it was impossible at times to find the important uh, yes. intelligence material. So you, in essence, were creating a program that filtered out right. the valuable stuff. That's right. Uh, what, uh, what did it have a name, the program? <laughs> well, it's called Thin Thread. I mean, Thin Thread was our. Uh, a test program that we set up to do that. Uh, by the way, I, I viewed it as we never had enough data, okay? We never got enough. It was never enough for us to work out, because I looked at velocity, variety, and, and uh, volume as all positive things. Volume meant you got more about your target. Velocity meant you got it faster. Variety meant you got more aspects. These were all positive things. All we had to do was to devise a way to use and ut utilize all of those inputs and be able to make sense of them. Which and, is what we did. And when they didn't use your system, they, uh, the NSA developed another or attempted to develop another system? Well, that one the failed. State. They didn't produce anything with that one. And that one was called? Trailblazer. Yeah. And Trailblazer. I called, and, it, I called it five-year plan number one. Five-year plan number two was turbulence. And <laughs> Trailblazer is, cost how much money? I, was, I think in my, my sense was a little over $4 billion. Four billion dollars, right. but it was scuttled. It was um, uh, done away with in two thousand six. Uh, yes, five, I think it was. But, but yes, that's right. And and uh, we developed our program with three million dollars, at roughly. I mean, and, and Trailblazer was largely developed by uh, SAIC. The uh, well, there were contributing contractors, yeah. But they, I think they had the lead. They were the lead contractors in some of the contracts, yeah. And. Why did they go with this one, though ultimately they did not use it? This is under Michael Hayden at the time? Yes. Uh, well, Under the Bush administration? Well, I thought my sense was it was a good employment uh, program, and it was a, a large budget program. They would spend money, a lot of money, so it would build a budget and— Go to a major weapons manufacturer, right. and heads of the agency, National Security Agency, would go back and forth working at NSA, it working was, at we SAIC. We called it an incestuous relationship, yeah. What happened to you after you quit? You quit within a month of the 9-11 attacks. Uh, 31st of October, oh. 2001, yeah. And then what happened? Well, we tried to form up a company to, to at least help the government to deal with some of the massive data problems they had, like in, uh, even in the FBI, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, uh, Customs and Border Protection and um, NRO and various other agencies. And every time we went somewhere to try to develop something, why uh, we got our con can't we got canceled. Our contract got canceled for basically because they, we we have heard anyway that they were told that uh, certain agencies didn't want them have, hiring us, so they didn't want us working for them. So, and, and before you <clears throat> left in that short period, when I, uh, what it became obvious to you the direction that uh, the NSA was going to, did you? When you raised objections or raised concerns, what was what was the well, response? Well, I went directly to the intelligence committee. Because it was their job to, because first of all, when that happened, I mean, the people they had to use to set it up, since they used part of the program we developed to set it up, um, they had to use our people to set it up initially, because no one else knew the code and no one else knew how to get it operating. So when they did that, they came, those people came to me and said, you know, they're doing this, you know, and they told me what they were doing. And uh, so I immediately went to the Intelligence Committee, because they were, the Intelligence Committees were formed to have oversight over the intelligence. Uh, community 
to make sure they didn't monitor uh, U.S. citizens. This was a fallout of the Church Committee uh, back in the 70s. Um, and uh, uh, the, the member of, of the staff that I went to went to Porter Goss, who was chairman of that committee at the time, and uh, he referred her to um, uh, General Hayden for any further when it was the job of that committee to do the oversight on all this domestic spying, and they weren't doing it, okay? Um, basically, the, at the time, according to uh, Dick Cheney's interview <laughs> uh, on the 10th anniversary of 9-11, he said the, at that time the, only the uh, majority and minority leaders, the Hipsy and the Sissy, were involved in having knowledge about this program, Stellar Wind, which you had talked with Tom Drake about. The former NSA right. Um, right. employee, who is also a whistleblower. And, and that was the program, of course, that uh, Director Mueller reported was the issue that with the hospital visit with Ashcroft. So— um, uh, it, And explain that very briefly for, to remind people. Well, uh, uh, the whole program, I guess, uh, w had to be uh, reauthorized every 45 days. And they had to have the director of NSA, the director of CIA, and the uh, uh, attorney general sign an affidavit that they still needed the program. And it was legal. And when uh, Comey and uh, Goldsmith in the DOJ decided that uh, this really was a violation of the Constitution and uh, was illegal, uh, then that issue came up. And that's what, uh, that's what got everybody uh, kind of disturbed and ready to ready actually to resign um, in 2004, early 2004, I believe that was. And, uh, and as a part, it was coming up for reauthorization. And so, um, uh, Gonzalez left the White House, along with uh, uh, one other person I can't remember, and went to the hospital where um, Ashcroft was, because he, he was uh, had pancreatitis, I believe, and was in the hospital, and um, Comey was acting uh, attorney general. And so, at that point, uh, they went to Ashcroft to see if he would overrule Comey, who had denied a reauthorization and declared it basically illegal. Um, and so, uh, they tried to get Ashcroft to overrule that and went to the hospital. Uh, to do that. And uh, Director Mueller, I think, also uh, quickly got to the hospital to help uh, ensure that uh, that uh, Ashcroft was not taken advantage of, I guess. So. When was your yeah. home raided? 26th of July of 2007. What happened? Where did you go? Uh, I should, I should uh, say that it was, uh, it was uh, the morning of the second day after Gonzalez's testimony, the then Attorney General Gonzalez's testimony, to the Senate Judiciary Committee on the on the uh, TSP, the what was called the TSP, which I referred to as a fabricated plan, uh, it was created to cover uh, a number of plans. Uh, one of which was stellar wind, and the others which they didn't want to discuss, and the others were uh, wiretapping. And so they picked on the wiretapping ones because the public would generally say, yes, anybody that was potentially a terrorist, a foreign terrorist, communicating with anybody in the United States, we want you to monitor their communications. So that was the acceptable part of it, but it was grouped with uh, Stellar Wind and uh, some other programs, so, so, so that they could give cover to it, talk about some programs, say they're talking about the terrorist surveillance program, but uh, it was basically a group of programs, some of which they did not want to talk about. And he did not testify to that at the—and uh, I believe uh, some of the White House and uh, 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 Feingold, I think, were the two who were on the, on the Senate Intelligence Committee that did— uh, Challenge him at the time, saying he wasn't being truthful and that it was he wasn't being completely honest. So, you live where? I live in uh, Maryland, actually four miles from NSA. And what happened? Uh, they came busting in. Who was they? <laughs> uh, the FBI, about twelve of them, I think, ten to twelve. Um, they came in with the guns drawn on my house. Where were you? I was in the shower. <laughs> I was uh, taking a shower, so my son answered the door, and they, of course, pushed him out of the way at the gunpoint and uh, came running upstairs and uh, found me in the shower and came in and pointed a gun at me while I was, you know. Pointed a gun at your head? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Wanted to make sure I saw it and that I got, was uh, duly intimidated, I guess. And what did they um, what did they do at that point? Did they begin questioning you or they just took you uh, uh, to <clears throat> headquarters or? No, no, yeah. They, they basically separated us from, from, I was separated from my family. They took me on the back porch. Um, and they started asking me questions about it. Uh, they were actually basically wanting me to tell them something that would in, in, in implicate someone in a crime. And so uh, I told them that I didn't really know. They wanted to know about certain people. That was, they were the ones that were being raided at the same time, Fr people who 
we all signed, the, those who were raided that day, all of us signed the, uh, the DOD IG complaint. We were the ones who filed that complaint. The Pentagon. The Pentagon DOD uh, Inspector IG. Inspector General against, complaint. And against NSA, yes. Uh, talking about fraud, uh, basically corruption, fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, Tom and, Drake was uh, raided at the same uh, uh, No, he was raided uh, in November of that year. We were just the ones who signed it were raided. So, so, and what, who were the other people that were raided that same day? Uh, Diane Rourke, uh, Kirk Wiebe, and Ed Loomis. Diane Rourke worked for the Senate committee. She, she, Diane was the uh, senior staffer. Uh, she had the NSA account on the HIPSI side, on the House side. So she was monitoring. She was doing oversight. She was doing real oversight. The others weren't. <laughs> uh, basically, the others were simply taking what the NSA said verbatim and taking them at their word. So basically, that was not oversight. But Diane would probe and be prying into the, uh, what they were saying to find out really clearly what, the, what was going on. And, and, and ostensibly, they were searching for who was leaking information to the New York, who had leaked information to that, the New York that Times. The, that was the pretext, yes. Uh, but I uh, but I accused them of being sent there by some by someone outside the FBI, and that their body language told me that I hit it right on the head. So, and I also after after uh, uh, a while uh, they were questioning me. I couldn't tell them anything because I didn't know anything that would implicate any of the four of us. So. Um, they were uh, looking for leaks. Uh, well, um, that was the pretext, the leak on the, to give the New York Times thing. Uh, the real thing, the, what they were really doing was retribution and intimidation, so we didn't go to the Judiciary Committee in the Senate and tell them, well, here's what Gonzalez didn't tell you, okay? That was what it was really all about. And also it was retribution for that DOD IG complaint because it was rather embarrassing report that they gave. So, and, and what is it that Gonzalez did tell them? I mean, your, your, about, pers your perspective in terms of what is happening to our national security surveillance situation? Well, it was about it was about stellar wind and uh, and uh, all of the domestic spying. We're going to break. When it comes to snail mail, the old postal system, it's very tough for the government to intercept mail, except in times of war, particular uh, situations. Uh, when it comes to phone conversations, land phone conversations, you need a, a warrant uh, and uh, to be able to intercept phone conversations. But what about email and what about the communication now that is really the dominant form that uh, not only Americans, but many people around the world are communicate? What are the restrictions on the government in terms of email? Uh, well, after some of the laws they passed, like the Patriot Act and their secret interpretation of Section 215, which is my view, of course, is the same as Tom Drake's, is that uh, that gives him license to take all the uh, commercially held data about us which is exceedingly dangerous, um, because if you take that and put it into uh, forms of graphing, which is building relationships or social networks for everybody, and then you, and you watch it over time, you can build up knowledge about everyone in the country. And having that knowledge then allows them the ability to concoct all kinds of charges if they want to target you. It, like in my case, they, they fabricated several charges and attempted to indict us on them. Fortunately, we were able to produce evidence that would make them look very silly in court, so they didn't do it. Um, in fact, it was I was basically assembling uh, evidence of malicious prosecution, which was a countercharge to them. So, uh, do you believe all emails the government has copies of in the United States? I would. Th I, I believe they have most of them. Yes. And you're speaking from a position where you would know, considering your position in the National Security Agency. Right. All they would have to do is put uh, various uh, narrowest devices at uh, various points along the network, at choke points or convergent points where the network converges, and they could basically take down and uh, have copies of most everything on the network. The companies that are approached by the government uh, to participate uh, or facilitate uh, uh, the surveillance, uh, your sense of... Uh, the degree of opposition that they're mounting, if at all, and also, has there been any kind of qualitative change uh, since the Obama administration came in versus what the Bush administration was practicing? Uh, well, first of all, I don't think any of them opposed it in any way. I mean, they, they were approached to saying you'll be patriotic if you support us. So I think they saluted and said yes, sir, and, uh, and uh, supported them, because they were told it was legal, too. And then, of course, they had to be given retroactive immunity uh, for the crimes they were committing. 
<laughs> so, uh, and approved by President Obama <laughs> and yes. and President Bush. Yeah, yes. I started with Bush. Yes. Yeah, and, and and the differences in the administrations. Uh, actually, I think the uh, the surveillance has increased. Uh, in fact. Uh, I, w I would uh, suggest that uh, they've as assembled on the order of uh, 20 trillion transactions about U.S. citizens with other U.S. citizens. How many? 20 trillion. And you're saying that this surveillance has increased, not only the yes. uh, um, targeting of whistleblowers like your colleagues, like people like Tom Drake, who are actually <laughs> indicted uh, under the Obama administration. Right. More times, uh, the number of people who've been indicted are more than all presidents combined in the past. Right. And I think it's to silence what's going on. But the, the point is, the, the data that's being assembled is about everybody. And, and it, from that data, then they can target anyone they want. Bill Benny, talk about Bluffdale, Utah. What is being built there? Well, a very large storage device, uh, basically, for a remote interrogation and remote processing. Um, that's the way I, I view that, uh, because there's not enough people there to be actually work the data there. So it's, it's being worked somewhere else. Uh, Where do you get the number 20 trillion? Uh, just by the numbers of telecoms, it appears to me, uh, from the questions that CNET posed to them in 2006. And they published the names and how the, what the responses were. I looked at that and said that anybody that equivocated was participating and then estimated from that. The numbers of transactions. That, by the way, estimate only was involving uh, phone calls and emails. It didn't involve uh, any queries on the net or any assembles, other, any uh, financial transactions or credit card stuff, if they're assembling that. I do not know that. And, okay. the, and the original, uh, <coughs> the original allegations that you made in terms of the crimes be, uh, being committed uh, under the Bush administration in terms of the rights of American citizens, could you— uh, well, I made that. I, mean, I, I reported the crime when I was uh, uh, when I was raided in uh, 2007, <clears throat> and it was that Bush and Cheney and, and uh, Hayden and Tenet conspired to subvert the Constitution and violate various laws of the, that existed, the statutes at the time. Um, and here's how they did it. And I was reporting this to the FBI on my back porch <laughs> during the raid, uh, <clears throat> and I went through Stellar Wind and told them what it did and uh, what the information it was using and how they were spying on. Or assembling data to be able to spy on any American. I want to go to a clip of Congress member Hank Johnson. He's the Georgia Democrat questioning National Security Administration Director General Keith Alexander last month, asking him whether the NSA spies on U.S. citizens. Does the NSA routinely intercept American citizens' emails? No. Does the NSA intercept Americans' cell phone conversations? No. Google searches? No. Text messages? No. Amazon.com orders? No. Bank records? No. What judicial consent is required for NSA to intercept communications and information involving American citizens? Within the United States, that would be the FBI lead. If it was a foreign actor in the United States, the FBI would still have to lead and could work that with, the, with NSA or other intelligence agencies as authorized. But to conduct that kind of, of collection in the United States, it would have to go through a court order, and the court would have to authorize it. We are not authorized to do it, nor do we do it. That was— General Keith Alexander, the NSA director, being questioned by Democratic Congress member Hank Johnson, Bill Binney, he's the head of your agency of the NSA. You explain what he's saying, what he's not saying as well. Uh, well, I think it's a—part of it is a term—how you use the term intercept as to whether or not uh, uh, the, the, the re, what they're saying is we aren't actually looking at it, but we have it, you know, or whether or not uh, they're actually collecting it and storing it somewhere. So the, so the mistake of the congressman was not to ask, are you collecting information? Well, he also said things like, um, well, we, we, uh, we, we don't collect or we don't uh, collect against U.S. citizens unless we have a warrant. And then at the same time, he said that we don't, at the same uh, interview, he said we don't have the capability to collect inside this country. Well, those are kind of contradictory. Is he lying? Is General Keith Alexander lying? I wouldn't—you know, the, the point is how you split the words. 
I wouldn't say lying. It's a kind of avoiding the, the issue. Jacob Applebaum, how does this relate to you, and how powerful is General Keith Alexander? I was saying to Bill that I think he's probably the most powerful person in the world in, in the sense that— the, More powerful than President Obama? Well, sure. I mean, we— I mean, if he controls the information that arrives on Obama's desk, and Obama makes decisions based on the things on his desk, what decisions can he make if, except the decisions presented to him by the people he trusts? And when the people he trusts are the military, the military makes the decisions, then the civilian government is not actually in power. Bill, Benny, you're nodding your head. Yes. Uh, I mean, well, for example, uh, uh, their, their responsibility is to interpret what they have and, and report up echelon. So, I mean, that's the, re that's the responsibility of all the intelligence agencies. So they basically filter the information to what they believe is important, which is what they should do, um, because, you know, they're occupying. They, it takes time for uh, leaders to uh, review material to make decisions. So they have to boil it down as best they can. So it's a function of, uh, of, of, of uh, their processing. But it, but it is important that they do it correctly. <laughs> to make sure the information that gets there is correct and uh, complete. Is as General Alexander more powerful than President Obama? In the sense of making—of presenting information for decision-making, sure. 